They're toning himself. He's going to give you a nice uh, program about hidden treasures of the Catskills. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for coming. Beautiful weather out today. It was a, I come from Dutchess County, so it was a nice ride, a nice hour and 20 minute ride. And then I finally found the fall foliage. We haven't found it in the Hudson Valley yet. <laughs> it's, and the leaves are falling off while they're still green. I don't know. Um, tell you a little bit about, I started writing a Hidden Treasures series. I write a weekly column for Gannett newspapers um, on kind of the same type of places. I try to find not the FDR home in Vanderbilt Mansion or big mansions down in Tarrytown, which everybody knows, they're mainstream tourist sites. I try to find sites that are kind of off the mainstream tourist radar, but have a lot of history associated with it. And so I wrote three books called Hidden Treasures of the Hudson Valley, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And then I decided I was going to write a Hidden Treasures of the Catskills book. Um, and this book has 50 sites spread all throughout the Catskill. I didn't realize how big the Catskill was. I put out a thousand miles on my car on multiple days because I had to play with the sun to take the pictures. So I couldn't, you know, I had to come up a few different days. And uh, I mean, the sites go way out to Schoharie. So I have the whole uh, region covered. And uh, what I do with these books, some people that have come to lectures that have bought a previous book have said they keep the book in the back seat of their car because they use it as a day trip book. They'll read the history and then to, to kind of promote taking day trips to these sites because that's the only way we'll save them. Uh, I have the address so you can put it in your GPS. And if it's off the beaten path, I give driving directions how to get to it. Uh, so you can make, and then if it's uh, run by a historical society or say the museum ran something, I would have their contact information, website, phone number. So if there's any special events, like I have some revolutionary war sites, you know, you may want to go when they're having an encampment one weekend. So you can go on their website and check. So having said that, we'll get forward with the hidden treasures of the Catskills. And I start in uh, the foothills, what I call the foothills of the Catskills. And for the first site, we're gonna go to High Falls. High Falls being located just west of Rosendale, to give you a point of reference. There were two brothers in the 1800s, uh, Maurice and William Wirtz, W-U-R-T-S. They lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and they had a coal mine up in Carbondale, Pennsylvania. You can call it the Northern Poconos, if you like, uh, very north. They wanted to get their coal down to the Hudson River, obviously to get it down to New York City on ships to expand their marketplace. But there were no trains in the early 1800s in the area. So what the Wurtz brothers decided to do is build a 108 mile canal from Honesdale, Pennsylvania, down to Kingston, New York. And when they did that, that 108-mile canal was called the Delaware and Hudson Canal. A lot of people called the D&H Canal. Uh, had 108 locks, 37 basins, and it ran through a lot of the communities that, you know, you could still see remnants of it here and there in different communities. Cost them and they completed it in, in 1827. It cost $1.2 million to build. So they, they must have had money to start with down in Philadelphia. Um, it was initially four feet deep, and it had these small canal boats going through. But as the Words Brothers uh, started working with this operation, a lot of companies along the line started paying them to carry their products, too. So the canal boats weren't just carrying coal down to the Hudson River. The Hudson River is called the Rondau District in Kingston today. That's where the Rip Van Winkle boat goes out. There's a lot of restaurants and everything in there. That was originally very quiet farmland, maybe 100 people living in the area. And it became a major shipping port when this canal ended up there. A lot of ships coming in, brickyards opened up. And by 1840, there were 10,000 people living in that Rondau district from the hundred that were there in the uh, beginning of the 1800s. Well, in 1966, well, let me back up a little. 1899, 
Now you have rails. Railroads were coming through since the mid uh, 19th century. And the Rhodes brothers found it was faster and was more cost efficient to ship your coal by rail rather than coming down the canal route. So the canal shut down and the Rhodes brothers went out and bought a railroad. So they stayed in the business. They st stayed controlling it. Well, in 1966, some residents in High Falls created the DNH Canal Historical Society, and they opened the museum in this former Episcopal church that was built in 1885. Two years later, the locks that go through High Falls was designated a National Historic Landmark. You have locks 16 through 20. They date to 1847. 15 feet wide, 15 feet deep, made to hold larger boats, and then they would hook into the main canal and get down to Kingston, and that was to bring more products down. They cleared all those locks out. They cleaned. There's no water in the locks now. I've walked that trail many times. Each lock is 90 feet long. So today, people take a nice leisurely walk along. It was about two blocks away from here. But then what happened was in 2014, they got a substantial grant from New York State and they went two blocks over to actually the foot of the locks and they bought this building, which was an old restaurant, the 1797 Depew Canal House. I don't know if anybody ate there. It's a good restaurant. Yeah. This is now the museum. And obviously now they have two floors. They have tremendous exhibits. They have a lot of the artifacts from the DNH canal on display. They even have a working model to show you how the canal worked. I was lucky before the pandemic, I went down on a cruise through the Panama Canal and it was the same, same theory with the doors opening and everything. And they, they just explained to you how the whole operation went. And then what's nice now is just beyond the left side of the building is the front of the first uh, lock. So you can take that uh, five lock walk. When I like to go is in June, they have a benefit for the museum. It's called the five lock wine walk. And every time you get to one end of a lock, they serve you a different kind of wine. So being Italian, that's right up my... And I got to tell you, the last walk I went on, I lasted three locks. <laughs> I hit the third lock and they were serving my roll. I just sat on the bench, fill it up. <laughs> I was good. But it's a really, really nice place. And I'll tell you, most, I would say the vast majority of sites in my books are free. This particular one charges, but it's $3. And that's another goal of my book, you know, Believe me, I love, I've spoken at the Presidential Library, the FDR in Hyde Park seven times. It's a great place. But instead of paying $15, if you go with a family especially, it's nice paying 2 or $3 to get into some of these places. So that is the D&H Canal. Now, if you go up Route 213, which is right in front of the museum, you'll dead end into 209. So when you hit 209, we're going to head north now. And we're going to come to the next place, which is Hurley, New York. In 1662, a group of Dutch and Huguenot settlers settled in New Dorp, D-O-R-P, which was the original name of this community. Um, because the original inhabitants, the Esopus Indians, really weren't pleased with these settlers coming in, there was a lot of tension going on. And at one point, the Native Americans burned down all the houses in New Dorp that were on today's Main Street. Well, the settlers quickly rebuilt them, but instead of building them out of wood again, they built them out of stone so that at least they'd survive another attack if it happened. And fortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, they were quickly rebuilt, but in 1664, the settlement fell under British control and its governor, a man named Francis Lovelace, he renamed the community from New Dorp to Hurley after his ancestral home back in England. The only difference with the spelling was his spelling was H-O-R-L-E-Y, -R -E which was changed after the American Revolution for obvious reasons. They wanted to get rid of any English um, reference they could. So there are nine stone houses erected along today's Main Street 
And according to the research I said, they have the same characteristics being one and a half stories and having moderately pitched roofs. That's what all the bios say. I, don't, I wouldn't want to climb that to knock the uh, ice off of it in the winter. And they're all constructed of Ulster County limestone. Now, this is the Van Eaton Dumont house. And I do trips from May through October. I do all day bus trips for different senior centers and AARP and things of that nature. And we visit a couple of sites in, in my books. And then we stop for lunch at a place along the route. And I brought three groups over to this place. And when we came in front of the Dumont house, there's a historic marker out front that says that British Lieutenant Daniel Taylor, who was a spy, was brought out of the dungeon. They had a dungeon in the, in the bottom floor in the basement of this house where they kept British prisoners. And the sign says they took uh, British uh, Lieutenant Daniel Taylor out, put him on a horse, took him down the street and hung him from a tree. Well, that's kind of true. But I told the group that I had in front of me the real story. They took him out of the dungeon in the basement, put him on the horse, put the noose around his neck, and he had a massive heart attack and died on the horse. But that didn't stop him from bringing him down the end of the street and hanging him for everybody to see for three days. So the historic sign was a little skewed, but it's a really, really neat area, area to go. Now, um, the same year, 1777, the British attacked Kingston. And they attacked the area called today's, it's called the Stockade District. And the reason they attacked that area is that was New York State's first capital. When the British landed on the shoreline of the Hudson River, our first governor, George Clinton, heard that they landed and he took the whole state government from Kingston Stockade District to Hurley. And the whole time while they were repairing, because they burned down virtually every house in the Stockade District, and so for about eight months, they operated on Main Street right in this house here in the center. And uh, that was where that was actually the home of the New York State government during that eight months until they repaired the house, the old Senate house, and they moved back to the stockade district. Also available for uh, visits if you go to this area is the 1853 Reformed Church of Hurley. And the Hurley Heritage Society actually runs a museum out of one of the stone houses that they bought. It's right across the street from this house on the other side of Main Street. And again, it's $3 to get in. They give you a tour of the place and they also offer walking tours of the, of the entire area. Now, again, I have a favorite time of year to go here and that's in July every year. They have the Hurley Stone House Day. And I believe it's $12. However, all these houses are privately owned. And on Hurley Stone House Day, all the private owners open their houses to everyone. And so you'll go in with a docent and they will tell you about the history of each individual house. This is a very interesting one because they'll show you where the, uh, you know, the governor met with all the people running the state government. And the Dumont house is always an interesting house to go into. I've never been down into the dungeon. They don't bring you down to the dungeon, but they brought our bus tour all through the house. So it's a really, really interesting and a very inexpensive day trip to make. And, and I should mention, too, this is not that far from High Falls. And that's what I try to do. I try to cluster two or three sites that you can get to within 15 or 20 minutes. If you're going to drive an hour and a half, I want you to at least have enough to spend a day. OK, so if we go north now on 209, we're going to come to Route 28 and we're going to head out toward the Catskills west. And the next stop we're going to make is in Phoenicia. This is the Phoenicia Railroad Station. It was built in 1899, and it's one of three stations on the Ulster and Delaware line that were the large stations. The rest of them were small depots. The other two were Shandaken to the east and Oneonta to the west, and that was the end of the line. Uh, this was an important station because there was a, uh, people used this station, they would get off and then they would reboard a train that was heading north. There was a spur track right outside this station that went north. So if you wanted to get to Hunter or Tannersville, you would take the train out of Kingston, 
Well, for people coming from the city, they would take probably the railroad up to Kingston, get onto the train and come out to uh, come out to Phoenicia, get off. And if they wanted to go north, they would board another train that would just immediately go north on these tracks. When the station was built, it had five sets of tracks next to it, which uh, reflected earlier lines that ran through the region. The busiest season for tourist travel, and, and I triple check this, this is an actual fact, the busiest season for tourist travel at the Phoenicia train station was 1913, when 675,000 people used this station. I mean, well, let's face it, the Catskills, it's an all year operation. You have skiers, you have hunters, you, you know, and then you have the summer, summer people coming up. And a lot of them used it to go up to the northern place. At that time, they were not the big resorts in those days, but you had boarding houses and cottage colonies. And a lot of them would go up there and take part in that. Now, during the era, the Phoenicia Railroad Station was featured in a one real silent black and white film called the holdup of the Rocky Mountain Express. <laughs> so even in those days, Hollywood was fooling us. They, they purported that this whole thing took place in the Rocky Mountains. The entire film was shot in Phoenicia. It was initially produced on paper for use in storefront shows and Nickelodeons. How many of you remember Nickelodeons? You put the nickel in. Come on, guys. I remember them. <laughs> <laughs> you put the nickel in the machine and you turn and the paper flips. And that's how they produced this uh, to begin with. Passenger service ended in Phoenicia in 1954. You know, a lot of the railroads shut down as more and more people were getting private cars and the roads were getting better. Now we had parkways, highways, the New York State Thruway. And so in 1954, uh, passenger service ended and freight service ended in 1976. The Shandaken station, which was built in 1907, was immediately torn down. The station at the end of the line in Oneana was turned into a retail shop. So if you ever go to Oneana and you see a building that looks exactly like this and it's a retail shop, that's the original train station. Now, before they could take this down, there was a railroad enthusiast that lived in Phoenicia, and he wanted to save this station. For what, he didn't know, but he didn't want him to take it down, so he bought it from the line, and they were happy to get rid of it. He held on to it until 1985, and then he sold it to the nonprofit Empire State Railroad Society, Railway Society. They restored the whole inside the way it looked with the waiting rooms and the ticket windows. They, they painted the outside, fixed the roof. And every weekend from May through October, this is a museum now. And they have a lot of artifacts in here. And you can go in and check out all the displays. They brought a lot of the things in from the line and kept them in this building here. So that's another little stop you can make along the road. We're going to go further out on 28 now to Oakville, and then you go north on Route 30, and you will come to Roxbury. And in Roxbury is this house, Woodchuck Lodge. This was the summer home of American naturalist and writer John Burroughs. He was born right here on this farm, his family's farm, in 1837. At 17 years old, he left the farm to go to the Cooperstown Seminary. Now, when I say seminary, a lot of people think, well, he went to become a minister. They called colleges in those days seminaries. He, want, he studied to be a teacher. And when he graduated, he started teaching here and there. He even taught in Illinois for a little while. Came back on his 20th birthday to marry his childhood sweetheart, who he met while he was living here in Roxbury. Now, support his family while starting his writing career, Burroughs took jobs as a federal bank examiner and later as a clerk at the Treasury Department in Washington, D.C. In 1874, he bought a nine-acre pig farm right on the Hudson River in West Park, which is just south of Esopus. There's Kingston, Esopus, and then West Park. Um, he transformed the nine-acre pig farm into his estate, built a beautiful stone house. And uh, it's very interesting because in the first volume of my Hidden Treasure of the Hudson Valley, I have his cabin. Eleven years after he moved into that house, onto that estate, 
he went a mile and a half west into the woods with his son and he built a cabin. He called it slab sides because of the rough bark on the outside of the cabin. He lived in that cabin from April to November every year by himself. And then in November, because the cabin did not have heat, he came home to his estate and lived with his wife. They had a very long marriage, <laughs> very happy marriage. I was building my house, actually, my cabin on the back of my property. Um, what he did was starting around 1910, he started to uh, take his family up here to his, his childhood uh, farm that he grew up on, and they would spend the summers here up in Roxbury. And he put it, in, he, they stayed in this house that his brother Curtis built in 1860. It's a two-story, three-bay house consisting of three bedrooms, one on the first floor and two upstairs. And Burroughs installed a Franklin stove immediately into the dining room. And he built a lot of the furniture the same way he did in his slab size cabin. It's called camp style furniture. He would walk around the property collecting wood and he would build all the furniture out of that. He named the house Woodchuck Lodge after the frequent visitors while the family was staying there every summer. Burroughs uh, also built the porch, which is made from sticks and things that he found on the property. And that's basically what the furniture looks like inside. While riding home on a train from California in 1921, he was on a speaking tour. He died on the train uh, and uh, he was 83 years old. He was buried just north of this cabin. This is his grave site right in front of Boyhood Rock. It, you know, when I was researching him, his much to the chagrin of his siblings and his parents, while everyone was working on the farm and milking the cows, he was sitting on that rock reading books, which didn't go well with the family, but they, they felt he would want to be buried in front of that rock. And this is his grave site. This place is actually one of the smallest New York state parks you'll ever find. It's, it's run by New York state. Now they keep it maintained and everything. And on weekends, you can visit the cabin. There's a local preservation group because in 1973, his great, great nephew, Grand nephew donated it to this conservation group and they keep the place in good shape. There's docents in there. You can go in. It's free of charge again. And uh, they'll tell you all about John Burroughs. When you go to his grave site, the state put up some canopies and some pavilions, and there are some placards in there so you can learn a little more about them. But this is another freebie and well worth the trip. Now, going from Roxbury up 30 to the very end, you will come into this place, the Zadok Pratt House. This was built in 1826 in the western section of Wyndham by Zadok Pratt, and he was a tanner and a saddler by trade. This was the most prominent house in the town. Pratt had earlier opened the Prattsville Commercial Building, a large tanning operation that spanned 500 feet by 43 feet. That's how big the building was. And because they needed so many people to run this place, this town's population exploded. Many people moved into the area. He actually uh, sponsored the construction of 100 workers' houses in the town as these people were relocating. And that uh, those houses were built using leftover hemlock lumber from the tannery. So he was into recycling before it became fashionable to recycle. In 1856, during a major renovation of the house, this section here is a former 1843 Greek revival style bank, and they attached it to his house. And he actually ran a tavern out of that one little former bank building there was a separate entrance around the side on the northern side of it. And uh, this house does look not that big, but it goes back very, very far uh, when you get to it. Now, being very influential in, in the town, they actually named the town after him, Prattsville. Pratt was appointed Justice of the Peace and Foreman of the Grand Jury. In 1836, he was elected a congressman to the 8th Congressional District. And in 1842, he established the Prattsville Advocate 
a weekly newspaper, which was the first newspaper in that area. In 1843, an unemployed laborer approached Pratt. He was walking outside his house. And as much as he loved to help people and things like that, he wasn't so much into welfare. And this fellow approached him and he said, you know, Mr. Pratt, I'm out of work. You know, he was looking for a handout. Well, Pratt said, tell you what, what did you do for a living before you were out of work? And he said, well, I was a stone cutter. Well, Pratt immediately turned and pointed to a cliff that was overlooking his 350 acre farm that he had at the time. And what he said was, I'm going to employ you. I want you to carve my life and career on the side of that cliff. I didn't say he was humble. (laughs) Well, believe it or not, this guy worked on that thing and got a regular paycheck every week from Pratt for 28 years. He had his whole career. What did you do for a living? Well, I carved Pratt's life on the side of a mountain. Uh, the only reason that ended was Pratt died at 80 years old. So the paycheck stopped and so did the thing. This is just a small part. And in recent, more recent years, they painted some of the engravings white so you could see it. This is right down the road from his house. And you could park about eight cars in there. It's, it's another little park. It's called Pratt Rock Park. And they have switchback trails. So no mountain climbing necessary, no ropes necessary. You could just go up the switchback trails. This is just a very, very small section of it where I can get a good picture of it without the uh, trees in the way. But it goes along the whole cliffside. And you can walk along this trail and see all the carvings. I think the stonecutter paid homage to himself right here, too. He took a little liberties with that. Pratt's house is now a museum. And, uh, you know, you can combine these two with the woodchuck log. There's always a lot of things in the area to see. Before I go further west, let's go back to the Hurley Stone House. We left, we went 213 out to 209, and we went north. Well, let's go south this time, and let's go to this site nearby in Napanak. The original building hotel was put up in 1845 by a man named Thomas Rich. He sold it six years later, and it was named Hungerford's Hotel after the new owner's last name. In 1887, Adolf Wagner purchased the building, and in 1895, an adjacent building went on fire, and it caught fire onto the hotel, and the hotel was completely destroyed. Wagner quickly replaced it with this three-story Dutch colonial style building. So this dates to 1885. It reopened as the Colonial Hotel and it serviced passengers on the Ontario and Western Railroad, which stopped at the Napanock train station. And also this was very popular for workers that were building that D&H canal that we talked about earlier. They stayed here overnight and they at least ate in the dining room here many times. The hotel went through more than 20 owners through its lifetime, and in 1900, John Goslin bought it, and he lived actually on the top floor with his family while operating the hotel. He sold it in 1906 to James Shanley. I get confused with all these names, 20 owners. Uh, He purchased it for $10,000 from Goslin. Now, Shanley had a lot of money because he owned numerous restaurants and hotels all across the country, and he was living down in Manhattan. He moved up with his family, and he did a lot to the building. Uh, 1908, he added a bowling alley in the building, a billiards room, a barber shop, and additional guest rooms. Among the guests that stayed at this hotel during its heyday were Thomas Edison and quite a few times Eleanor Roosevelt. In fact, Shanley's wife, Beatrice, became friends with Eleanor Roosevelt because she's the, Ro, Eleanor Roosevelt loved coming out here. It was like the country. You know, she was away from Hyde Park. She was away from Sarah Roosevelt, her mother-in-law. So that was a good thing. Um, and, and she loved coming out here. And they got to be so friendly that when FDR won the presidential election in 1933, when he took the oath of office, they were invited. The Shanleys went down to the inaugural ball. So it was pretty, pretty uh, well-known establishment. As well as he was doing business-wise, 
A lot of strange things started happening here. 1911, the barber's daughter wanders off onto the neighbor's property and falls down the well and dies. In 1912, Shanley's five-month-old daughter dies unexpectedly. 1913, his four-month-old son dies unexpectedly, unexplained. 1916, another son died at nine months old. And in 1918, Beatrice Shanley's sister, who was living in the hotel, part of the hotel with her husband, dies during childbirth, giving birth to her third child. So a lot of things started getting a little weird here. It had a dark side. During Prohibition, Shanley got a partner and they started manufacturing elite, a bootleg alcohol and selling it out of the basement. And in 1932, the, the hotel was raided by federal agents. In 1937, Shanley dies of a massive heart attack, and his wife Beatrice sells the hotel in 1944 to Al Hazen. Now, I'm not going to even try to explain this, but I'll pose two questions to you. Was it a coincidence that Shanley and Hazen were born and died on the same day in different years? Think about that. And just to give you another little bit of uh, trivia about the two men, they were both born on Halloween. So <laughs> the hotel closed in 1991 and in 2005, it was purchased by its current owner. And um, after restoring it, the building reopened. And now there's a lot of, uh, you may have seen some on TV, they've done paranormal studies here and everything. And you can actually stay there overnight and take, not my thing. <laughs> if there's ghosts floating around, I'm a baby when it comes to that. But uh, they do a lot of paranormal stuff and everything, but you could still stay at the hotel today. So now, right up the road, like I said, I like people to have different places to see. We come to this place that might be familiar to most of you. It's called Gramsville, the C. Burton Hotel. During the 19th century, Gramsville became a popular summer resort destination for individuals coming up from New York City. The C. Burton Hotel originated as a small wood frame tavern that was built in 1851. Two years later, Mr. Burton tripled the size of the building and erected this Greek revival style hotel. Now the original hotel, the original tavern part is on the south side of the building. So that was the original section. He fitted it with a two-story recessed porch and a formal ballroom on the second floor. Now, guests coming up from New York City typically took a train out to Fallsburg, and then they took a stagecoach to Gramsville from there. And that's how they arrived at the hotel. Now, a really big thing happened for this hotel because in 1878, there was the introduction of a county fair in the hamlet. And that increased the whole hotel's business. Admission to that fair the first year was 10 cents to get in. And the very first day, they sold 425 tickets to that uh, fair. And of course, that's now known as Gramsville's Little World Fair, which is today the longest running independent fair in New York State. The influx of fairgoers who needed lodging while they came up for the fair or just wanted a drink in the hotel tavern really boosted the business at the hotel. Now, eventually, as some communities in Sullivan County uh, were experiencing a decline in tourist trade in the early 20th century, the hotel was purchased by Dr. Lamour to use as his resident, residence and medical office. He also continued to accept lodging guests and renamed the place the Sycamore House. And later on, he renamed it again to the Hawthorne House. In 1938, Dr. Carl Messenger purchased this building and expanded the first floor to include his medical office, a surgical area, and a large waiting room. The second floor served as his family's private residence. He also rented the north side of the building as a two-story apartment complex. Now, Messenger sold the building in 1944 to the Littinger family. Anybody know them? The Littinger family? And they resided there for the next 50 years. When they sold it, 
the buildings remained dormant since that time and i wish somebody do something with it because it's a really neat looking building but uh so that's one building the next building i want to show you in gramsville which i'm sure is very familiar to you is the greenfield meeting house built in 1838 and 1839 by members of the religious society of friends better known as the quakers uh, the building spans 39 feet in length by 19 feet in width, and the front entrance has two doors on it, one for men, one for women. The inside of the building, as is found in many Quaker meeting houses that were built during this era, is split down the middle, one side for men, one for women during worship services. Um, the land that the meeting house occupied was donated by a non-Quaker named Stephen Curry, who was a local farmer, but his son Daniel embraced the Quaker beliefs, and that's how he got involved with that. There was a local carpenter in the area, Leonard Porter, and he's responsible with the help of a member from the meeting to build the actual building itself. Now, in 1827, there was a schism among the Quakers. Um, they were orthodox Quakers, and they wanted to continue to follow the beliefs of the original Quaker founder, George Fox. And then there was a certain faction of the Quakers that wanted to follow the more liberal teachings of a Long Island preacher named Elias Hicks. I wrote about a lot of different Quaker meeting houses in the Catskills and the Mid-Hudson area. And those group, two groups split. One of them decided to stay in the meeting house. The others found another place to meet. In Gramsville, despite their differences, they always stayed together. They stayed a singular unit. And that's the way it went right through that whole era. In 1900, other meeting houses in the area were starting to experience dwindling numbers. And uh, they started coming here to meet... Uh, at this meeting house, because the Greenfield meeting uh, by the late 19th century had dwindled down to 19 members because a lot of people were coming and going because of the economy. Lumbering and um, tannery were very big and those were starting to fall out of fashion. So people were leaving the area. When the other members started coming from around the area, this place became known as the Never Sink Monthly Meeting and it's still active today. During the 1960s, an influx of new Quaker families coming to the area brought new life to this meeting. And at the end of this chapter, as a side note, at the end of the chapter, I also recommend that people save time if they're coming to see sites in the area to visit this familiar place. <laughs> I hope you all recognize it. <laughs> Okay, I was telling somebody earlier, there's going to be a couple of references to the DNH Canal. Here's another great reference, and it's up in Mini Sink, just north of Port Jervis, New York. And this is called the Roebling Bridge. Now, when you look at this bridge, you may think, well, okay, it's a normal bridge. You just drive across, it's between New York and Pennsylvania. No, this was part of the DNH Canal, it was filled up to the very top with water. And I'll give you the history of what happened. This is a 535 foot wire suspension bridge known as the Delaware Aqueduct or just Roll Rollings Bridge. It was erected over the Delaware River in the 1840s as part of the DNH Canal. Now here's the problem that they had when they put this bridge up. Originally the canal boats were coming down on the land down here and they would have a tow rope to get them across the Delaware River. Well, what was happening was barges were coming down the river, and this is a very fast moving river, the Delaware River. Barges were coming down carrying lumber and more than one canal boat, you know, it was no fault accident, I guess, if you had no fault accident in those days, but a lot of people died coming across that river because there were no brakes on these barges. So if you were coming down, you were taking your life in your hands trying to cross the river. Well, in 1846, Russell Lord proposed the construction of a bridge over the river to provide unrestricted route for canal boats. John Roebling's design was selected for the project and it cost $41,750 to build this and, and to reroute the canal water and everything they got up onto this bridge. 
This operated successfully for 50 years until the canal shut down in favor of railroad service in 1899. They immediately cut the towpaths. They were towpaths on both sides of the bridge where employees would walk along with a mule that was pulling the canal boat through. They immediately cut them off because they didn't want it to deteriorate and possibly fall down and hit a boat that was going underneath. Um, the bridge's protective ice breakers were not maintained and were destroyed by the river over time. Water was immediately drained out. They drilled holes in the bottom. They were drilled out. And in 1900, the bridge was purchased by Charles Spucks. And Charles Spucks opened it up to vehicle traffic. That's when vehicle traffic could get across. And on the New York side, he built the toll house. And he had a wooden gate that he would manually lift. So if you wanted to go to Pennsylvania, you paid him the toll. He lifted the gate and you went across to Pennsylvania. Um, believe it or not, it remained in operation till like the 1980s. He, he was in operation for a long, long time here. And that's when the National Park Service purchased the bridge, the toll house, and uh, everything is free now. The toll gate is down. You don't have to pay a toll to get across. Now, the toll house now exhibits photos and artifacts about the operation through the years. And there are informational displays that exist on the Pennsylvania side of the bridge. So you can actually walk. They built new towpaths across. Have you been there? I know you live in the area. You can walk right across that, that bridge on the towpaths, or you can walk on a little sidewalk they put on the inside of the bridge if heights get to you. Um, now, I know this isn't hidden treasure of the Catskills, but I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you. When you get to the other side, to the Pennsylvania side, if you go a half a mile north, you're going to come to the Zane Gray house. Zane Gray was a very popular Western writer. New Riders of the Purple Sage wrote a lot of great Westerns. The National Park Service owns that house. That is also a freebie. So you can go up there, visit this bridge, visit the little museum they have in here and see all the artifacts. Go up and see uh, Zane Gray's house. Haven't spent a penny yet. And then if you come back to New York, instead of turning south on 97, to go to Port Jervis or north, you would go to Narrowsburg. If you go right across 97, you're at the Minisink Battlefield, which was the only, that was the only battle that took place in this region during the American Revolution. And as, uh, you know, you can walk the trail around the whole battle site and there's uh, placards that tell you everything that went on. So, uh, by the way, if the name Roebling is familiar to anybody, in 1883, he, he designed the Brooklyn Bridge, which when I was growing up in Brooklyn, I'm from Brooklyn, in case you haven't, <laughs> in case you haven't been able to understand the word, you know, it's Brooklyn. And that bridge has been sold many times when I was a teenager, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Want to buy a bridge? Man. Okay, let's go out to Schoharie now. How's my time doing? Good. Let's go out to Schoharie now. This is the furthest site out in the Catskills. And this is a very interesting site, the Old Stone Fort. This started in 1772 as a high Dutch reformed church that was built by Palatine settlers. Approximately 3,000 German Palatines came over on 10 British ship, ships in 1710, free of charge, and they returned a promise to support the Royal Navy. Well, within two years, they realized they didn't have what they needed to support the Navy, and the British Parliament stopped supporting them, and they scattered all throughout the area, some as far as Schoharie. So they're the ones that built this church in 1772. Now, when the American Revolution broke out, they felt that this was vulnerable to attacks by the British. So they enclosed the property around it, a half acre log stockade fence, a high stockade fence all around the church. It became one of three forts, believe it or not, during the American Revolution. They stopped doing worship services here and it became a fort. And this was known uh, as the lower fort along the Schoharie River. On October 17, 1780, 800 loyalists attacked the surrounding communities. They tried to get over the stockade fence, but between, 
people on the roof and everything shooting down at them. They never got over. But in the backside of the building, there is still a cannon ball that hit the lower part of the church and they never repaired it. It didn't do any structural damage. But you could still see that hole in the building today. When the Revolutionary War ended, the stockade fence was removed and regular church services started again. Uh, in 1844, with two new reformed churches opening in the area, this original one was sold to New York State for $800, and now it enters its third uh, use. The state removed the belfry and increased the height of the tower by nine feet. And in space formerly used as the church uh, choir loft, they extended it to a whole second floor to make it a two-story building. And it was used through the Civil War and up to 1873 as a militia armory. So, I mean, this how many uses could this building have? The Schoharie Historical Society was founded in 1899 and they were tasked with creating a museum in this building to local history in that area. They began to, because it was a county project, they began to relocate other historic structures from around the county onto the surrounding area of this church. And so there's an old one-room schoolhouse, there's a law office, and a beautiful Palatine barn that are located on this property today. Now operating for almost 130 years, the museum welcomes visitors to view exhibits and artifacts from the fort's heyday and welcomes them to visit the other buildings. They're usually always open, so you can just stroll in and go around. And for those of you that are into covered bridges, as a hobby, I, I photograph covered bridges, red barns, and lighthouses. Within a short walking distance of this stone fort, there's a beautiful covered bridge that goes right over the Schoharie River. So you can even go visit that. So there's a lot to see in this area. Like I said, if you're going to go all the way out to Schoharie, though, I want you to have other things to see. And this is not really that far away. The Blenheim Power Plant is a hydroelectric power station that generates more than 1 million kilowatts of electricity by drawing water from the Schoharie Creek. Its visitor center is housed in a restored 19th century dairy barn that offers guests a myriad of exhibits and interactive displays that demonstrate the science of energy and electricity. Throughout the use of video presentations and computer technology, the science is explained in detail. And to augment power displays, such special events are held on the grounds, like maple sugaring demonstrations, a tra travel log lecture series, a woodsman weekend that features the lives and works of American mountain men. And this stays on a regular basis from May through October. Adjacent to the visitor center is the house that belonged to the dairy barn, and that was uh, built in 1819 by politician John Lansing Jr. as a gift for his daughter and son-in-law, Jacob Livingston Sutherland. Among other positions Lansing held during his political career was he was a member of the New York State Assembly. He was in the uh, Confederation Congress in 1785. He was Chief Justice and New York State Supreme Court, and he was the mayor of Albany. Today, the ha now you know where he got all his money from. Just a little side note. <laughs> Today, the house contains authentic period furnishings from the early 19th century, and it uh, was acquired in the early eight 1970s by the New York State Power Authority. The house tours, you have docents in every room, and the tour of the visitor center, all free of charge. It's a state property. Now, if that's not enough, you visited the Old Stone Fort, you visited this property. Right next to this property here is Mill Kill State Park. And the big centerpiece of that is they have a cascading 80-foot waterfall. So if you do photography like me, that's a must stop. It's borders. The properties border each other. And the only fee you're going to pay for that whole day adventure is the parking fee in the state park because the state has to get its money. I do have a chapter in here um, on the resorts. How could I do a book on the Catskills and not put the Concord and Krushnas and all these resorts? And so there's only one building still standing. 
This building uh, started as Stevensville, the Stevensville Hotel. Uh, and it's uh, now called the Swan Lake Hotel, but now it's abandoned. And when I went out there, I was taking pictures on the property and a caretaker came out. And it's, so there's one person that lives in this whole thing just to take care of the place and make sure nobody comes in and vandalize it or anything. But actually, the tourism in the Catskill area started, believe it or not, in the 1820s uh, with fishing and hiking and other activities uh, in that in the region, attracting people from the city to come up. Originally, he stayed in bungalow cottages and boarding houses, but it was it was obvious that larger accommodations were necessary as the years passed through. In 1823, they built the Catskill Mountain House, which was the first major luxury resort in the area. And a year later, the Catskill Mountain House, a luxury hotel, opened on South Mountain and quickly became a destination. There, there are a bunch of funny stories about how that later hotel opened. They called it the Chicken War. It, it was a fellow that was in there with his daughter and they were serving the Catskill Mountain House. They were serving a certain meal at night and she had a restricted diet for medical reasons. And this very wealthy man wanted them to make something that could accommodate her. And he ordered chicken and they said, we, we don't do chicken. He got into a big argument and the owner came out and said, listen, if you want chicken, build your own hotel. So he built his own hotel right down the road. <laughs> There's a hundred stories in this chapter. I can't go into all of them. Now, other luxury hotels were established in Woodstock. There's one on Overlook Mountain House. Uh, the ruins are still there. It burned to the ground. And then... The area quickly became a popular vacation spot for Jewish tourists from New York City. And that's how the region got its name with the Concord and all of that, as they call it the Borsch Belt or the Jewish Alps, if you will. I know when I was living in Brooklyn, a lot of my Jewish friends would go up every, every year. They'd go to the same resort every year. Grossinger's was a big one, too. Um, and where they got the name Borsch Belt, was a play on the name of the southern states that called the Bible Belt. So they went from the Bible Belt to the Borsch Belt. Um, in addition to the huge number of indoor and outdoor activities in, in that region, they featured a, a heck of a lot of big name entertainment. And that's where a lot of people got their start. Milton Berle, Jack Benny, uh, Robert Merrill, all kinds of entertainers. In fact, uh, the most recent one I can tell you is Jerry Seinfeld got his start, the Catskill Resorts. The popular Stevensville Hotel, later named the Swan Lake Resort by a new owner, is now closed. And I was speaking with the caretaker who said a heart surgeon in New York City owns it. And he's trying to revive it and get it. I, it could probably be a good thing now because they have the casino up there and Monticello Racetrack and I just wanted to pay homage to that area. And I tell little stories in that chapter about the different resorts. Of course, Grossinger's was used as a model for Dirty Dancing, that famous movie that came out, except they filmed the whole movie in North Carolina, not in the Catskills. So they pull a fast one on us again. You can't trust Hollywood. So I've been going on for about an hour. I'd love to take some questions if you have any. And this is the shy period. <laughs> I'm patient. Come on. We have also uh, 28 people online. Hi, guys. And I'm going to attempt to unmute, or they, I believe they can unmute if they have any questions. You can each individually put, unmute if you have any questions. Any questions? Yes. One, um, it's kind of a random story I've heard once or twice. Um, there used to be a, re a little resort down towards Ellenville right on Route 55. I think it was a golf, uh, golf course there and stuff. And going back to John Burroughs, there's a local story, and I'm not sure the details, but he hooked up with Henry Ford at this place, and they tried to come on up to Grandville, and I think his car overheated on the way or something. That the only one I know, the only resort that I know, you know, north of Ellenville, of course, because they had... Uh, is the Peg Lake Bates had a resort in Kerhansen. And I actually drove there. I actually drove there one day. And what it was, was I was surprised it deteriorated. It's just in terrible shape. 
But I was surprised because it deteriorated so much that you could see it was single wide trailers with a facade around them. So you didn't know it was single wide trailers, but obviously the walls were starting to cave around it. And I said, oh my God, that's because I got out of my car just to check it out. It's just abandoned right now. But then that's why that road along that strip is named Peg Leg Bates Highway. Everybody know who Peg Leg Bates is? He was a one-legged uh, dancer, tap dancer or whatever. He, he made appearances quite a few times on Ed Sullivan. And uh, he was pretty famous. He's a pretty famous guy for one leg. I'm not sure if our online people can hear me because um, you have the microphone. Um, Any questions from online? And if they want to unmute, they could ask a question. And if you want to unmute, I can hear you through the speaker here. I love technology. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a funny story while we're waiting to see if anybody, I do a lot of, uh, I do about 80 of these programs a year, but I also speak for Rhodes Scholars. You know what Rhodes Scholars, that group, you can go on week-long learning vacations. And I was doing one at Mount St. Mary's College a few years back. And it, the week was called American Pop Culture. So they took them up to the original Woodstock site and they went through the museum. And one night they had me in because I have a two volume book on the infancy of rock and roll. I interviewed a hundred recording artists from the fifties and the sixties, Connie Francis, Chubby Checker, all these. And so they wanted me to give that lecture one night and they called me the day before the lecture. And they said, Tony, just to let you know, it's a full house. There's 40 people and they're all from Alabama. <laughs> I said, well, that's fine. I, you know, I don't, I love meeting people. So I go down there, I give my whole talk on doo-wop and rock and roll. And I said, any questions? And this little lady in the front row raised her hand and I said, yes, ma'am. And she says, well, I don't have a question, but I have to tell you, I'm very impressed that you did the whole thing with a doo-wop voice. <laughs> I said, well, come back next week. I'm talking about my book on Franklin Roosevelt with the same voice. <laughs> I've been up here 40 years. This is not going away. <laughs> Any questions there? I don't see anybody. Okay, how about here? Any questions here? No? I have I have just a statement to make, but I was born and brought up in Brooklyn, and it's great to hear a Brooklyn accent again. I'm out here on the West Coast. And I understand you perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> that's good <laughs> i have a childhood friend living in san clemente on nixon's old estate obviously he did much better than me <laughs> are you going to work your way west in new york at all i have people now trying to push me to do the adirondacks uh I, you know, I have a new book coming out in February on the mothball fleet that used to be on a Hudson River. I don't know if you know about that, but remember we had Rosie the River during World War II, and they were building tons and tons of ships and aircraft. Well, at the end of the war, the Navy finds themselves with 7,000 ships and no more war. So they didn't know what to do with these ships, and they picked eight locations around the country to store them. They just anchored them side by side. And one was just south of the Bear Mountains Bridge at Jones Point. And at its height, there were 189 Navy ships anchored side by side with chains. And they just stayed there. They called it the Hudson, the Hudson River Naval Reserve Fleet. Everybody else called it the Mothball Fleet because they just lay there. Uh, but a very interesting history. So that's coming out in February. And I'm already working on the next one. So the Adirondacks may have to wait till 2024 because the next one I'm halfway through it. You know, this pandemic, I haven't done a lecture in two years. Uh, so I was writing. So now the next one is going to be Madams, Mobsters, and Murders in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. And because I'm Sicilian, mafia is never mentioned once in the book. There is no mafia. Thank you. Well, you know what that stands for. <laughs> Mafia. Yeah, Mothers and Fathers oh, Italian oh, Association. Yeah. Come on, I grew up in Brooklyn. <laughs> 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 Questions, comments? Yes. Where did you live in Brooklyn? East New York. 
East New York. I was right near Rockaway Beach, and I was probably a 50-minute ride from Coney Island and Nathan's Footlong Hot Dogs. We went every Wednesday night for fireworks and hot dogs. Yeah. yeah. It was it was a great growing up there, you know. But I tell you the truth, when I moved to Dutchess County in the 80s, uh, I got an offer I couldn't re refuse five years later, and I ended up back in Manhattan working as a writer editor for a monthly magazine. And I was doing a five hour commute Monday to Friday, two and a half hours going, two and a half. And I had the best of both worlds. I had this, the excitement of the city, and I had, you know, two farms on either side of my house when I got home at night. So I enjoyed it all. I enjoyed it all. Is that a question? Oh, I thought you went. I did that once at an auction. And I bought two goats, believe it or not. There was a fly by my eye, and I went like that, and the guy picked it up, and I ended up with two goats, and I had a Ford Pinto. Come on. <laughs> well, I have the books available if you're interested in it. There's 50 sites in the book, and there's $17 a book. But thank you very much. A great turnout.